Hi everyone, I'm Angie Kellen, and this is Shot Talk with Aki Fujimura. Aki is the CEO of D2S, and D2S is the managing company sponsor of the eBeam Initiative. Hello, Aki. Hi, Angie. Thank you for joining me today. Thank you. It's nice to see you. Well, you've had a very busy summer. <laughs> I hear that several industry luminaries have joined you for the panel at Kirby Design, mm -hmm. um, the panel on Kirby Design, over at the Design Automation Conference, or DAC as we like to call it this past July. So you've been promoting to the design community that manufacturing can now use Kirby Design. And I know you're doing that so that they're gonna start thinking and coming up with ways to kind of exploit this potential. So yeah. uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Yeah, for 40 years, as long as I've been in the industry, um, uh, design that you put on the wafer has been making the Manhattan assumption. It's like one layer goes this way, another layer goes this way, and their axis parallel. That's been the assumption for so long. But for the first time in 40 years, because of multi beam writing, um, manufacturing can now manufacture curvilinear designs. You can target them, target uh, curvilinear designs on the wafer, right? That's not been possible before, so the world's kind of going under the assumption that it's not possible, but now there is this possibility in manufacturing. So what's, what can we do that's new? What kind of benefits can we bring by exploiting that new possibility? And this is all a question that's being posed to the design community, the design automation community, to see, look, there's this new possibility there's a great opportunity for students or research organizations within bigger companies or whatever um, to uh, see what's possible, right? There are new algorithms that might be invented. There are new capabilities that might be invented that's never been possible before. Um, uh, maybe it was possible before to design, but it wasn't possible to manufacture, so it wasn't useful before, right? But now it can be done. So, so what can we do? So, so you know, we're trying to... Uh, in some ways, insight, you know, um, uh, and inspire maybe uh, this community to work on this new thing, new possibility. I see. So, who did you have on your panel? Ah, yeah. So, we had a, a, an incredible panel, really. Um, we had John Kiberian, uh, who is the, the founder CEO of PDF Solutions, um, a, a very uh, successful public company. Um, uh, they are the yield management company, um, and uh, uh, he uh, had a lot of good things to say. And obviously, he has a lot of experience in what's possible in manufacturing and bridging that the design side too. So, so that was great. Um, uh, we also had. Uh, uh, Ezekiel Russell, uh, who is the leader in lithography at Micron Technologies, a memory company. And uh, he's been publishing for uh, quite a while now the benefits of curvilinear design in the context of memory design. Um, and uh, uh, specifically, they've been very advanced in the use of curvilinear mask shapes which enables curvilinear design. So, so he's been working on this issue and using it strategically, uh, even though the tool set uh, is not quite, uh, you know, he talked about, uh, you know, what's lacking. Um, and uh, 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 he has a, a unique perspective in this new opportunity. Yeah, we also had Professor, uh, Professor Andrew Kang, um, and uh, uh, he's a, a UCSD professor uh, that's been working on uh, physical design and other aspects of EDA for quite a long time. Uh, he has a long history of design for manufacturing innovations, and he has several patents in, in that area. Uh, he's also the head of Open Road, or he's the the kind of the founder of Open Road, um, uh, uh, which is a, a open software version of the EDA two flow, and uh, 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 he's uh, got a lot of good perspective that brings in um, not just uh, the academic algorithmic side of what might be possible in EDA, but also incorporating uh, holistic thinking uh, about uh, what's realistically possible 
for adoption, you know, thinking about business and everything else. He's very good at that, uh, that, that whole thinking. Um, and then we had Steve Tai, um, uh, who uh, uh, has a, a, an incredible innovative uh, uh, history. Uh, he's been as, as he's a CEO of a second chip company uh, called Perceive that's doing uh, low power deep learning uh, chips. But uh, uh, he did another chip company before that. Prior to that, uh, he did uh, drug discovery, you know, using machine learning techniques. And also, uh, he's uh, the uh, founder of uh, uh, Tangent, which you know, co-founder with me of Tangent, uh, that uh, started the current set of place and route wave in making the Manhattan assumption, but doing over the cell routing. So, so he has uh, the perfect background, right, in both being the customer side of this in having a fabulous chip company and also having a very deep uh, history uh, in, in physical design EDA. Now, before the panel actually started, I know that you had given an overview on the situation of Curvy. And so that might take a little bit of understanding for us to kind of to get, right? So maybe we can start with the basics. So the wafer is printed using photomass, right? Right, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So there's an important aspect. Uh, and, you know, us in manufacturing, we take that for granted, but I know that that's not uh, commonly understood among the design people. So uh, uh, it's important to know that the way manufacturing happens is you first make what's called a photomask, and, and then the photo mask is being put into a wafer lithography machine, and then the wafer lithography machine basically prints um, many, many wafer or you know portions of the wafer um, repeatedly, um, because the same mask is used to um, uh, print many, many copies of the chips. And it's very important to get the mask just right. Right? Because anything that's not right on the mask gets repeated every time, right? You know? So, um, uh, so uh, in EUV lithography, which is the leading edge lithography, masks are reflective. In the older style, uh, 193i is what they call it, or before, uh, kind of lithography, mask is kind of transparent or not or somewhat transparent and transparent and not, and uh, light goes through the mask or bounces off of the, uh, the material that's blocking it. So um, uh, either way, and the photo mask manufacturing is a very important part of what results in very high precision mask uh, wafer uh, lithography. Um, what, um, uh, What's important about the difference between mask and wafer is that in order to make wafer manufacturing more reliable, the mask shapes are very, very different from the desired wafer shapes. They decorate the mask and they put what's known as uh, sub-resolution assist features on the mask to help the light do a better job of being more resilient to manufacturing variation. What's happened recently because of multi-beam mask writing is that these mask shapes have become curvilinear. And uh, what the industry luminaries are saying everywhere is that the future of masks, advanced masks, are all going to be curvilinear at least in part, if not uh, the entire mask, but you know, at least in parts, in the critical parts, and be curvilinear because it's just accepted that curvilinear mask shapes produce better wafer results, more reliable wafer results. So curvy mask shapes exist, or I should say, maybe they're becoming more increasingly curvilinear. Would that mm -hmm. be correct? Yeah, 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 yeah. Increasingly more curvilinear. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, and, and it's important to know that there's a difference between the mask shapes being curvilinear and the wafer shapes being curvilinear, right? So what, what I'm talking about now is about mask shapes being curvilinear in order to print better even Manhattan targets on design. So um, 
from the kind of the dynamics point of view, um, it's not like uh, curvilinear masks are being enabled in order to enable curvilinear design. Curvilinear masks are being enabled because it's better for wafer lithography, even if the targets are strictly Manhattan shapes. Right? So manufacturing is doing this all on its own for its own sake. Now, what's important to notice about this is now that you can manufacture curvilinear shapes on the mask, you can also manufacture curvilinear shapes intentionally on the wafer. Right? Without the masks being curvilinear, you cannot have wafer targets that are curvilinear, or at least not efficiently, not, at least not in the entire mask, for example, being curvilinear. That would be impossible in the old uh, system. But in a new way of doing things, which is multi-beam-based mask writing, it is possible to do it. So this is something that's been enabled for the first time, like I said, in 40 years. Well, that kind of was my next question. I was mm. going to say the multi-beam mask riders, mm. of course, first available by IMS, and mm. then now, of course, New Flare mm -hmm. too. Um, they're the enabling piece that's allowing these curvy masks, correct? That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. In the old style of mask making, which was called VSB or variable shape beam, um, you actually wrote, uh, took the mask shape that you want and then divided up, they call it fracturing, fractured it into constituent rectangles or uh, sometimes 45 degree uh, triangles were allowed too, but no other angles. And because, um, you know, you can break up a curvilinear shape into a bunch of small, tiny little rectangles on 45 degrees, right? You could do that. But because VSB machines write the mask one shot at a time, if you did those little tiny things to make uh, curvilinear shapes, it's possible, but it would take too long and it's not economically feasible, right? So it hadn't been practically possible to target curvilinear mask shapes. But multi-beam changes that because multi-beam works just like your TV screen or you know, uh, your cell phone or whatever. And, uh, it, it's just using pixels and pixel doses, grayscale pixel doses, to uh, project any shape on the mask at the same time with the same precision regardless of the target shape. So if I have this correct, curvy masks are possible and it's really good for semi wafer manufacturing, mm -hmm. okay? Um, and then this is kind of like enforcing a point you brought up earlier. Written on the wafer and the chip, it's still done in Manhattan shapes, even with curvy mass, is that correct? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, well, regardless of what you're uh, targeting, whether it's uh, Manhattan shapes on the wafer or any other shape on the wafer, you are writing the masks now, you want to write the masks now with curvilinear ILT, and, uh, inverse lithography technology, which is a kind of a advanced OPC technology. And um, uh, it, uh, 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 it makes for better wafer quality and, and you know, more reliable uh, wafer writing. What's the relationship between curvy masks and curvy design? Yeah, so um, because now that we have multi-beam mask riders and now we have ILT, inverse lithography technology, that's using kind of a pixel-based computing uh, inside. It's using the, uh, 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 its computational units are pixel-based, uh, just in a similar way, and uh, same math, as multi-beam riders are riding with pixels, right? If you compute with pixels, then you're resilient to the difference between Manhattan shapes, diagonals, or curvilinear shapes. You compute in the same time, and you compute with the same quality. So because IoT is producing these curvilinear shapes, and multi-beam is writing these curvilinear shapes on the mask, now the manufacturing side actually can accept curvilinear design targets 
and create mask patterns that are appropriate to be uh, resilient to manufacturing variation and be able to write the mask. So the manufacturing side is really all set to be able to take curvilinear designs. Now, you know, other than a very uh, specific and small data volume kind of situations like photonics or, um, uh, or like, you know, some inductors or some specific capacitors or antennas or something like that, and where curvilinear shapes uh, do exist today, and, but they're not used inside of standard cells or inside of uh, standard cell routing areas or, you know, they're not used in mass. Right? The smallest features everywhere are, are all Manhattan or maybe sometimes 45 degree diagonals because of the history of VSP based mask writing. Um, that doesn't have to be the case anymore for the manufacturing shape. It is an issue though that, as the panel pointed out, that uh, it is an issue that uh, the design infrastructure today makes the Manhattan assumption. So the challenge for the uh, EDA community or the design automation community um, is to say, well, you know, is, is, you know, now that the only limitation is us, right? What can we do on the software side to enable this? So you're saying that an assumption that's been true for about 40 years mm. um, is kind of in the process of going away. Mm. So this is a really big disruption, correct? It is, it is. Yeah, that's exactly what uh, uh, Professor Kang said, actually, um, that uh, uh, this is clearly a very interesting academic subject. This is clearly something that can have benefits, right? And it is a huge disruption, no question about it, right? And, uh, you know, John Kibarian uh, said pretty much the same thing. So um, there is... Uh, there isn't any question about whether uh, this is a, a, a really great, huge opportunity or not. The question is, what are the barriers and, you know, what non-computer science, non-technical, uh, like, aspects, like how companies work and business impact and things like that. Those, those probably are the, the principal concerns. Well, and that brings me to my next question, mm. too, is what do the panelists have to say about the barriers to adoption on something like this? Yeah, yeah. So uh, uh, Professor Kang was uh, 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 pre-organized uh, uh, in, in his way. Uh, he's um, always been a very holistic thinker, right? So, so he's not a, a you know, computer scientist that, that just thinks about algorithms, right? He thinks about you know, what infrastructure, what uh, ecostructure support is necessary to make something successful. So in that sense, it, it, it was totally really uh, uh, expected, right, that he would take that kind of a holistic view to this kind of an idea. And he's saying, while this is clearly technically very interesting and, and you know, there, there's no question that there's got to be some really good benefits, um, the question is, what about um, uh, the relationship between fabless and foundries, right? Would they just, you know, kind of stare at each other and, 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 and there would be a stalemate, you know, kind of, you know, like, uh, like you know, one would say, well, you know, if the uh, fabless might say, well, we can't do anything until the foundry supports it. And foundry might say, well, if nobody's interested, you know, we're not going to invest in it, right? So, so there has to be some kind of a collaboration that breaks that stalemate. That was uh, one of the things that, uh, that he said. Um, there are um, technical uh, barriers today in what the tool set can do. Um, Ezekiel Russell uh, was very vocal in saying that, well, while Micron is so interested in do, uh, the benefits of curvilinear design, they actually do it today uh, by hand. And it's incredibly cumbersome and very time consuming and uh, uh, labor intensive because the two chain is not ready to do a bigger scale use of curvilinear. And even the smaller scale takes a lot of manual work. They only do this manual tedious work because it's worth it, right? So that's a big so, statement. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he's saying that um, there is uh, no question in his mind that curved linear design has some real benefits. The question is, um, 
uh, you know, that's a memory maker's perspective, right? Is there a set of tools that can emerge that can enable curvilinear design in the, in the masses and be able to do it quickly and efficiently by automating that process, right? And that is definitely a challenge, no question about that. And, uh, you know, John Kavarian and Steve Teig also agreed that today's tool set um, is making the Manhattan assumption. Right? There's one exception that Steve talked about a little bit, which is the X-architecture work that was done uh, uh, 20 years ago, I guess. Um, and uh, uh, the X-architecture used 45-degree routing in the upper layers of metal to reduce uh, power consumption and to improve speed and to reduce die size and perhaps even eliminate a couple of layers of metal. Um, so it had uh, uh, big benefits, like, you know, like if you're making a connection from here to here, if you have to go like this in the Manhattan Assumption, then that's a much longer interconnect than being able to make a direct connection like that, right? So, so it takes advantage of that to make a 30% improvement overall in uh, total capacitance of the design. And, and uh, uh, Steve was uh, the principal inventor of, uh, of that mechanism, so he knows it very well. Um, and uh, uh, e even though that's, um, uh, that's a subset, right, of curvilinear design, right, and in those days, only 45s were manufacturable, so only the X architecture was manufacturable, right? But today, curvilinear, any curvilinear shape is manufacturable. You do have to change design rules, right? You know, design rules are narrowest in one, one direction, typically. It depends on the light source, but, you know, typically that would be the case. And you have to make it wider and wider as you go. But uh, that's something that can be done, that can be handled. So, um, it, you know, what would be the benefit of being able to do curvilinear design above and beyond what X already showed to be uh, a benefit? Right? And uh, Steve actually went into uh, a discussion saying vias are the enemy in routing. Right? From his experience, right, vias get in the way. When you have vias that change layers, it gets in the way of the next layer doing stuff. So if you can do a connection in one layer, instead of popping up with a via, going over, popping down with a via to get down, and, you know, in Manhattan direction, right? And uh, uh, if you could somehow eliminate that, then that is going to be a huge benefit, not only for being able to make connections uh, shorter, but being able to get out of the way of other connections in the, in the layer above. And when you do that, it's, uh, it, there's a, a, a virtual cycle. He, uh, that's, what, that's the word he used, uh, uh, two words, I guess. Virtual cycle that, gen that generates because the elimination of the vias from here to here is going to, in turn, reduce the number of vias needed from that to the one above. And that, in turn, makes the one above less for the one going up. And so there is this, this overall benefit that you get. And how he talked about uh, that virtual cycle and explained it to all of us. And so, um, uh, so he thinks that uh, in addition to the, uh, the benefit that X showed in 30% reduction in capacitance, the reduction in vias will make things much more uh, routable. And that's when uh, John Kivarian's uh, comment uh, really came into play. And um, John was saying that uh, because he, you know, he knows manufacturing inside out, right? So, so he understands that the future of semiconductor technology is making the transistors going vertical and trying to pack the uh, transistors as tightly as possible. And there is a specific roadmap that uh, the industry is adopting that is going in that direction. In addition, power routing that is right now uh, inside the standard cells running, uh, you know, power and ground running in parallel all the way through in metal one and even metal two um, is uh, about to become uh, delivered on the back side of the wafer. So if you have a wafer and you have metal layers up here and power routing is like this right now, it's going to soon be 
uh, underneath the wafer on the other side, reducing the amount of metal space that power is taking up today. It's not just reducing the space, it's actually eliminating the blockage that it represents. If you have power going like this, you can't go up through it, right? But when you eliminate that and put power delivery on the other side of the wafer, now all of a sudden that space is opened up. So you can make connections in any direction, right? So being able to do uh, curved linear design should enable something like that. And that kind of technology is needed, John Kaburian was saying, because everything is being packed more in transistors, which is going to make the inner connect much more the limitation of how much you can pack the whole chip. Because in the interconnect limited world, it's even more important to be able to reduce the vias, vias are the enemy, like Steve was saying, right? So, so this is all symbiotic and uh, it should be able to work to uh, take advantage of the new world where the standard cells are much smaller with less number of tracks and have the interconnect technology keep up. So his, his most important point, I thought, was that working on interconnect is the important um, counterpart to what everybody is doing to make the standard cell smaller. Now, we kind of covered about the benefits, and they need to be clear so that you know, the barriers can be overcome. Um, also, on the flip side of the benefits mm. is, you know, as you had talked about, the fear of the unknown. Can we mm. talk about that a little bit? Yeah, yeah. So uh, 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 a lot of people talked about that. And, and it's, uh, you know, Andrew Kang's thing about uh, being realistic about the real world constraints, right? It's not just about best technology always wins. It's not like that, right? And, uh, especially in manufacturing. And um, uh, if something is working, you don't want to muck with it, y you know, right? You're afraid to change something, even though there might be some benefit. You're afraid to change it because you're now not doing something that you know to work, right? Mm -hmm. So there is this fear of the unknown um, that is, uh, 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 you know, historically uh, a very strong limiter to what's possible uh, in uh, exploring what is the next generation thing, right? So um, what needs to be there, he was saying, to overcome that is the list of benefits. You know, the benefits has to be, have to be so substantial that those fears are overcome by uh, gradual uh, ex you know, exploration mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, proof points from here and there, right? So, um, yeah, it, uh, uh, fear of the unknown is a big factor. Um, and uh, it, uh, they all also talked about uh, what kind of um, EDA technologies are likely to be needed uh, to uh, enable curved linear design on the design side. With this education and all the comments from the luminaries on the panel, you know, they can come up with a way to overcome these barriers. They can work towards that. Uh, we talked about uh, routing, right? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, well, where really, uh, you, you can't really do automatic place and route in curved linear space today. And that, that, that it, even in small scale, you can't do it, right? I mean, Ezekiel has to do it by hand. You know, um, uh, uh, there's also uh, parasitic extraction. Um, when, uh, you know, Steve and I were working uh, on the X architecture 20 years ago, um, extraction was an important part of even just only doing 45 degree diagonals, right? In a curved linear context, it's even more important. And today's extraction uh, tools um, uh, assume that uh, shapes are Manhattan. Right, that you know, you have predominantly this direction, maybe with a one-track jog, and predominantly this direction, maybe with a one-track jog. And uh, when you can have any arbitrary, uh, you know, angles going at each other, uh, it's a different kind of a, a, an extraction problem. Now, uh, in extraction, there are some tools like field solver-based tools that can take any shape and work, but they are slow 
and they're limited to very small areas, right? So they're very accurate, and they can handle any shape, but they're very slow, right? You need something that works at the place and route level in order to enable curvilinear, uh, curvilinear design. Um, there's also, uh, you know, checking uh, DRC, design rule checking, and, and design rule checking tools today make uh, the predominant uh, Manhattan assumption. Now, you can handle any shape. You can have curvilinear shapes. You can do DRC. There are, you know, special, maybe extra cost options to be able to do photonics and, you know, other things where curvilinear shapes are, pre are prominent. Um, so it's possible, but it's not at the scale of uh, being able to do very small features that are curvilinear everywhere. Right? Now, thankfully, in, uh, a design, uh, uh, in a design rule checking, which is about uh, target designs on the wafer, it's very similar in computer science to mask rule checking or MRC. The MRC field uh, that all the DRC vendors already participate in is already familiar with the problem of checking curvilinear shapes. So there's been advances in the masks being curvilinear and what CAD is required to address that, that can be directly transposed to the DRC problem too. So we think that the problem is something that the industry in some ways, ergonomically, is already working on, but um, it's still a, a, a need for the future. Right, so the DRC extraction and uh, and routing. The the fourth one is custom design. Right, so uh, like when uh, the Micron uh, Ezekiel's group is doing uh, curvilinear design. Right, um, uh, you want to have something that makes that process easier and faster to do. It's possible today. Right, but um, it's not easy and it's not efficient, right? So uh, you want to be able to come up with some methodology. So, so those are the four areas that we can think of principally. Um, there are probably other opportunities around, right? But um, you know, it, it's not like logic synthesis would have to change based on this, right? The assumptions that logic synthesis might make about timing and things like that, right? Adjusting that might be important. Right? And same thing for placement. There might be adjustments about what it's assuming router is going to do. Right? But uh, they're probably not like fundamental level uh, foundational blockers. What is it that you want the industry to take away from the panel and what should we look for next, Aki? Yeah, so the, the number one thing is just the opportunity that there is and, and that from a kind of an academic point of view, it's really interesting. You know, and uh, uh, it, uh, I, I think any time there is something of a reason for commercial interest, there's two kind of things that I think can be researched right now. One is like, what would be the benefit if you could do this, right? And being able to show something like the X architecture doing 30% wire reduction, or you know, Steve showed some examples of 50% reductions of, of VIA count in the low layers, and, and, and those kinds of things applied more in mass and saying, hey, look, uh, it's clearly possible to reduce VIAs by this much, and maybe the virtual cycle element that Steve was talking about, where um, if you reduce VIA count in a, a metal one to metal two by 50%, what is the impact of that on metal two to metal three, and so on? Right? Um, I think that would be interesting. Um, I, I know the industry is already thinking about what would happen in the world of buried, buried power, right? You know, the backside, you know, uh, uh, delivery of power. But um, uh, some studies related to that and how the different layers, uh, lower layers of metal, a uh, local interconnect or metal one, uh, you know, those things can be, uh, you know, how many connections uh, can be completed in the lower layers if you broke the Manhattan assumption, right? You know, so, so these are all interesting research areas and coupled with that is the second aspect, which is what are the ergodomic innovations that are possible, right? And clearly um, from like D2S's interest, for example, is GPU acceleration, right? Because that's what we do. And uh, applying the GPU 
to these kinds of algorithms is an interesting area. So, um, you know, uh, I, I think it's generally interesting for everybody to be able to work on something completely new, you know, something that breaks on um, what uh, the industry has been working on traditionally for 40 years, right? You know, and uh, 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 that's the biggest thing. I, like, I, like uh, I, I would like the design automation community to take this on as a really interesting challenge academically and also as a business opportunity. Well, I want to thank you for joining me today, and we hope you join us for the next edition of the Fine Line Video Journal.